Hello everyone and welcome to episode 53 of the chess.com rapid rating climb series. In this series I play 15 minute plus 10 second rapid games on chess.com and I do have the goal of climbing rating of course because you want to win chess games but the main idea is to try and explain my thought process in depth while I'm playing so that you guys can see what I'm thinking about, try and get in my head a bit and apply some of the same ideas to your own games to help you improve and then use the post-game analysis to see what the computer thinks of my ideas, where I could have made improvements, where I actually went correctly, which that would be crazy, wouldn't it? And I can get educated and therefore better educate you guys. Anyway, check the playlist below if you want to see the previous episodes of The Rating Climb. But with that being said, let's search for a game. Okay, this is actually ridiculous. I just matched against this guy. I checked his account. He's won every single game with high accuracy. He joined two days ago, so I obviously aborted the game. Started another game, same deal, aborted the game. Started another game, and I have the same guy from the first time. So he's now reported and blocked because he's definitely cheating having a look at his account. But God, this is such a problem with rapid chess. Like, it really is. Okay, fourth time lucky. We actually have an opponent who I don't think is a cheater. Amazing. From the European Union. And Magor. We are going to play c6 against d4. And we'll see whether he goes into the Cairo or not. He does not. Uh, that happened in the previous episode and that was kind of crazy. So knight f3. We're going to go d5. He may or may not go for c4. No, we go c3. We might have a very symmetrical looking position. It's an interesting move. Controlling the f5 square so my bishop can't go there. Okay. Can I exploit that? I don't really think so. I could try and go like g6 to Fianchetto the bishop and put the bishop on f5. And I don't actually see a good way for white to stop that. Because we have too much control of e4 for him to play e4. Uh, that looks pretty good. And if g6, knight h4 controlling the f5 square, then the knight's kind of stupid. So let's go for this. This is a bit different to how I normally play Slav games. I normally uh, put the bishop on f5 or g4. Or play e6 and lock the bishop in. Put this bishop on d6 and castle. But in this scenario, I think this makes a lot of sense. Putting the bishop on f5. Now he may go queen b3. But I think queen b6 should be fine. Offering a queen trade. Queen c8 is also an option. But I might get hit with moves like g4 or knight h6. Queen c7 is worth noting. But he might be able to go bishop f4 anyway and then win my rook. So I don't see how I defend it. So queen b6, okay. We have the classic stare down of the queens. I want him to take me so I can open my a file. And he wants me to take him so he can open his a file. g4, aggressive move. Going after my bishop. Bishop to e4 is playable. Knight d2 is kind of annoying. Actually, I might go for that. I might go for that. And my idea is that if he goes knight d2 and takes my bishop, then I'm going to have a ton of pawns on light squares and replace the lack of a light square bishop with pawns. And then my knights should work well in the position that follows with a more closed position. I am a bit worried about g5, kicking my knight out and then taking and forcing me to take with the pawn. But if knight d7, if he takes then I'll just take with the knight and I'm happy. Knight d7, g5. I could take here. Because if he takes my knight, I'll take his rook. If he takes with the pawn... Then he's ruining his structure after knight h5. So knight d7, g5, take, knight takes, knight e4. Something like bishop f4. Is that a good position? 
It's tough to say. Also on my mind is knight d7, g5, knight h5, takes, takes. And he can't really play knight e5 because I'll take it. So this knight could go back to d2 though. And it becomes difficult to defend the e4 square. Hmm, interesting. I think I should go for this. If he takes, then I'll take. If he goes g5, then I'll take the knight. I think that's a good plan. By the way, I just want to say, uh, I don't think I've said this in a video, actually. So, thank you so much for the support recently on surpassing 2,000 subscribers. I really appreciate it, and I did not think that enough people would find this channel interesting for 2,000 of you to subscribe. So, thank you very much, guys. Um, I hope you continue to enjoy the content, and... As always, let me know if there's specific things that you would like to see on the channel. Okay, I think taking makes a lot of sense. Because, yeah, if I move this knight, then um, I'm going to have to take back with the v-pawn. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to give away the c4 square. And I don't want a weak e4 pawn. Knight takes. Mm. The knight can always maneuver back to d6 if I want. So that looks pretty good. Bishop f4, bishop g7, fighting over the e5 square. Looks good. e3, maybe preparing bishop d3. Does he really want to take this, though? I don't know. Bishop f4, bishop g7, e3. What can I do in that position? I could even go for f5, maybe, to try and support my knight. That's worth considering. Okay, bishop g2. I can consider the move h6 going after this pawn. And if takes takes, I open the h file. And if here, here, he can't... Well, he can go for this trade, but I feel like it benefits me. Because this is kind of a strong pawn. I think I like the move h6. Because if I put the bishop on g7 and then I decide I want to do h6 and he takes, and I'm wasting a move... So, I want to play this. And if I can trade this bishop off for this bishop, he will no longer have the bishop pair. And my knight pair might be able to be better than his knight and bishop. Remain to be seen. Obviously, with this whole queen stare down that started five moves ago, I want him to take me. He wants me to take him. I'm not going to take him. He's not going to take me. <laughs> so, because, you know... Both of us want to take with the A pawns. Bring a pawn towards the center. Because, you know, flank pawns don't do a whole lot, typically. Because they can only look one direction. There's no, like, minus B6 square for this pawn to be looking at in this direction, right? So, it only controls one square. Whereas if the pawn goes on to B6, it'll control two squares. And C5 is far more important as well. And we'll open this rook up. We can maybe make c5 happen in the future. Or just throw this pawn forward to b4 without compromising the integrity of the c pawn that would happen if we threw the b pawn forward without having this pawn join it first on the b file. It's an interesting kind of intricacy. And we're just keeping the tension between our queens. Of course, at some point, I can play a move like queen c7 and go, yeah, I no longer want to um, trade with you so tough luck we're not trading anymore knight e5 I feel like I have to take this I feel like I have to take maybe his idea is to play bishop to e3 and attack my queen to force a decision out of me but I'm gonna take takes my queen whoa so i was considering after takes the move knight c4 to attack his queen and try and get him to take me before he can play bishop to e3 because if we have takes knight c5 bishop e3 takes takes i'll take his rook at the end of the line he voluntarily goes for this and he wants bishop takes 
Okay. Rather than taking my knight uh, on e5, he takes my knight on e4. Is he just trying to double my pawns? I don't have to accept it. I can move this knight to a square like c4. But the c4 square doesn't look that good. If I take take... Bishop g7, he might have e6. That might be his idea. And try and triple my pawns. If take take, I also have the fancy move rook to a5 going after both pawns. And if e6 is played, I can take g5 because the rook will be supporting. Let's take. And now let's think because we could go e6. We could lock this pawn in place because it's difficult for him to attack this pawn. Because we have dark squared bishops, so the pawns on the dark squares are going to be more easily attacked, but more easily defended. We could start with this. Take, bishop takes, rook h5, bishop f4. There is this move g5. And after a move like bishop g3, g4, but you can always play h4. And if we go after this pawn with bishop g7, he's going to play e6, I think, and try to triple our pawns. So we could take to keep this pressure, keep this as an option, and then play e6, but then he has bishop to f6. So I feel like we should start with e6, so that if he takes, bishop takes, he doesn't have these ideas anymore. And this pawn isn't going anywhere. If he pushes f4, we can always take on Poisson. And if we get a structure like this, then e5 is going to be incredibly weak. This looks good. Pushing h4 doesn't do him any favours, because he can never take, because his rook will hang. So let's go e6. I don't want him to play e6. That's my point. Because if he gets e6 in, I either allow his pawn to survive on d6 square, which is not good, because it takes up a lot of space in my position, or I have to take and triple my pawns, which is also not good. I've got enough double pawns as it is, but I feel like I'm going to be able to win one of these pawns, or at least induce some massive positional weaknesses uh, if material remains level. Very interesting game. Not, not fireworks, like, at all, but it is a Slav position where my opponent hasn't gone for c4 in the opening, and it's been kind of tame. But I feel like we've dealt with this position nicely, and we've facilitated some good minor peace trades in our favour. I think... I have a feeling e6 might be given a great move to hold the advantage, because I feel like if my opponent gets e6 in, like I say... It probably goes to zeros. Because pawns, pawns are the soul of chess. Like Many players have said that before. Many players are a lot better than me. And a lot better than you. Who are watching have said that. And it's true. Pawn structure is very important. Because pawns are worth very little. So. Ooh, so they, sorry I was going to say. They, take, they uh, play a very important role. In just place holding. F4 is an interesting move. So if I take and take, he has doubled isolated pawns. Bishop g7, bishop f4. Rook a5, we might be able to play b4. And if we go to d5, then something like c4. It might be easier, however, to play bishop g7 first. Because if he takes... Mm, if he takes, then I think he's okay, actually. So no, I think we should start with taking. Open this rook up and weaken the c5 pawn. Okay, step one completed.
we've created some weaknesses. Whoa, rook h4. That might be an incredible move. I just spotted rook h4. The reason I love that move is because it stops bishop f4. It also locks the h-pawn in place so it can't advance and help in the defense. The rook has to maintain guard of the h3 pawn. It also guards e4, which might be useful. But we're preparing bishop to g7, winning the e5 pawn because bishop f4 is not playable. And if this bishop goes to a square like e3 to target b6, so let's say rook h4, bishop e3, he might try to come around like this, though. Rook h4, bishop e3. Mm. Don't know what I like here. Could go bishop c5. But I feel like the trade helps black. Sorry, it helps white. Because he has dark squared weaknesses. So rook h4 looks good, but I think this maneuver reduces the effectiveness of it. Hmm. Tough position to deal with. But we have time on the clock, so we can consider, and we can calculate. Bishop g7, bishop f4. <clears throat> what can we do? We could try this, but he does always have e3. Bishop g7, a more concrete line, is rook to a5, just going after the e5 pawn. And I think his only move is b4 to attack the rook. Rook d5, attacking, keep well, keeping attack on e5. c4, attacking the rook again. We have to step off the fifth rank. D4 makes the most sense to go after C4. How does he defend that? Rook C1. Can we go E3? Attacking the bishop? No. Because bishop just takes with an attack on the rook. So bishop g7, bishop f4, rook a5, b4, rook d5, c4, can we take? Because if he takes, we take the rook, take, take, we end up up a pawn, but we have... Not the best structure. That feels like it's not worth it. Rook h4 is still a move I like. I would like bishop c5, potentially, but then b4. With the idea of trying to lock his bishop out. If we start with rook a5, b4 doesn't work, so we take the pawn. So bishop f4. Hmm. Could go rook h5 just to put pressure here, but I don't really see how that helps. I don't see how that makes any difference to the position. Because I don't know which way I want to commit my bishop yet. If I put it on g7, then it is on g7. Whereas if I can keep it a bit flexible, then I can decide at a later date. Rook h4 again is a move I like. Bishop to e3. How do I get anything from this? Maybe bishop c5? Force a trade. I did consider this line already, but I didn't think it was good. Something like... Well, we can't go rook d1, because we'll take the a pawn. So... Maybe that's good. Maybe that's good. Let's do rook h4. I don't... I, I know I spent a long time on that move. Yeah, he goes for this. I think we need to go bishop c5 in this position. And I said I thought that this helps him, but... Okay, bishop f2. Interesting. 
take the here, the, the, the. How do I? Hmm. If rook to f4. Take, take. I think that's good. But if rook f4, bishop g3, rook f5, that looks good. I'm not 100% sure on this, but a rook on f5 looks good to me, targeting e5 and g5. And it's on a light square, so it's always safe from the bishop if the bishops stay on the board. Okay. And my open A file might be really useful because if I can say we exchange bishops, right? Ah, no, that doesn't look good for him. We have a lot of pressure. Um, King E7. Maybe we're going to swing this rook over. We also have E3. Maybe I should have gone E3, but I can do that at any time. Okay. He might go for this. Oh yeah, that would just trap my bishop. Maybe bishop to e3? Mm, I don't see what that does. Might be just worth going b5 to give my bishop a hidey hole. Yeah, let's do that. Also just control some important squares. Because this is a very strong structure. It's very difficult to break through this. Yeah, the rook is not infiltrating anywhere could go for this. We also go for this, threatening this. The rook is not infiltrating anywhere unless he goes for something like this, but these pawns are well defended and he's just weakening his own pawns on c3 and a3. How does he stop these threats? Let's say rook f1. Um, that looks like a good move. Maybe I should have considered bishop b6, bishop c7 to go after e5. Whoa. Okay. That's interesting. I could push this. The stop. What is, he can't do that anyway. And if this, then I give the d3 square, so. Yeah, let's just drop the bishop back to give bishop c7 as an option. Also, if the rook comes in, then we'll be able to kick it out with bishop c7. Although I guess we were already controlling that square. And yeah, because I guess my rook is very active on f4, sorry, f5. Just putting a ton of pressure on, bishop c7 might win this pawn. But I also feel like there's no rush. I feel like we have a lot of time in this position. So it's difficult for him to move. His rook can't really go anywhere useful. He can't now trade on f2. This bishop can't really move. If the bishop goes to f2, then we just exchange everything and win e4 probably. Sorry, h4. Or we could even push e3 if we really wanted. Don't know if I want to do that, but it's an option. Bishop f2, we also... No, we can't do this. Can't do this. I'm considering lines where we play e3, rook g5. Oh no, it doesn't work. I was trying to configure some kind of back rank mate, but it does not work. Worth keeping in mind, though, if e3 happens, the king is very un, uh, unhappy looking. If we go here, he might go rook back to d4. Wait, here, rook d4, take, take, take. Can we play that? We could just go back to the previous position, but I'm struggling to find a way through. So I'm going to do this.
The reason being because these pawns are still very, very weak. And e4 is currently protected. We also have c5 to kick the rook out. And there's no infiltration squares. Well, he'd have to go all the way back to like d2 or d1. Which is not very nice looking for him. I don't know how he defends g5 while maintaining defense of h4. Yeah, so if we take here, then he can take here. But if we start with c5, kick the rook out. The rook has to go to d1. d2 would get forked. So rook d1, rook g5. Going up two pawns should be winning. Ah, interesting move. But I think we can go f5 because the pawn's still pinned. If he takes we take his rook and we control the best open file he controls the d file but he doesn't have any infiltration points we control all of these squares whereas if he takes and gives us the a file we're up two pawns and we control the best open file because the h file i think i was saying a file sorry the h file the h file is way nicer i think he wants to come here and do something like this I don't think I can stop him, but... Although I could go e3 and go for this. <clears throat> Wait, is the king getting mated? How does he get out? Our pawns are controlling, like, literally everything. This is mate, no? Whoa! Look at that move. Up to 1999 ELO. Rookie 4 mate. The king is trapped in the middle of the board amongst all of my pawns and my king and my rook, obviously. That was a really cool game. That could be really high accuracy as well. Uh, I feel like I played that very nicely. Very positional game. I feel like my opponent really should have been pushing for more in the opening. But yeah, I quite like. I, I love games like that where you kind of just squeeze your opponent. Uh, he really didn't have a whole lot of moves, and I feel like he didn't make great trades, especially that queen trade. I feel like that only favoured me, but let's get into the game analysis, and let's see what the computer has to say. Make sure you stick around, because um, we could have a very high accuracy. So, analysis time. Not quite as high of an accuracy as I thought, but my opponent had 70.5, as in 70.5. I had 87.1, and there were a fair few like misses from my side as well as my opponent's side. This could be really interesting to have a look at. Oh, let's switch to my view. We have d4, c6. The reason I play c6 rather than d5 on move 1 is just to invite white to go into a Karo Khan, whereas if I go d5, then that is not an option, and I really like the Karo, hence why I do this. But otherwise, I'm happy to play a Slav. Knight f3, d5, c3. <clears throat> Knight f6. You can do any kind of move order here. And it's just an incredibly equal game. Because there's nothing really going on. You're kind of just developing your pieces. But the pawns are symmetrical. And each side has good control over uh, the e4 and e5 breaks. So it's kind of just bound to be a closed position and that's kind of what we got queen c2 is a bit weird though and i go g6 which the computer does like you don't have to go g6 bishop g5 was also sorry bishop g4 was also a fine move but okay i liked g6 just mixing things up a bit h3 bishop f5 queen b3 and okay queen c7 was playable i was concerned about am i just missing something Oh, queen c1 is mate. Whoops. Okay, but let's just say queen c1 wasn't mate. <laughs> and white could take this. Let's just say we have some position like this. Apparently the queen is actually getting trapped anyway. But I missed that queen c1 was mate. But okay, is what it is. Is what it is. Queen b6 is still fine. 
Um, I didn't want to go to C8 just because I felt that was a bit passive. So White doesn't want to take me because if he takes me, I just have a good position. And after the move G4, okay, well, let's just say White plays a move like Knight D2. I also don't want to take White because that's good for White. He could take with the pawn or the knight, probably the pawn, and open up his rook on the A file. This is just a typical kind of maneuvering thing in many openings that begin with D4. Or maybe even some that don't begin with D4. But it, it's a very common thing, basically. My opponent goes G4. So the computer likes not what I played. It does like it, but it's not its favourite move. It likes bishop b1, and after rook b1, queen b3, a b3, so the rook is not on the a file. And then it just wants to develop. Maybe put a knight on e4, bishop on g7. Nah, I feel like white's the only one who can get an advantage here. Other moves it liked, bishop e6, which just looked a little bit silly to me after moves like knight g5. But the computer says just retreat, and then the white knight is silly on g5. <laughs> Typical computer maneuvering stuff. Maybe I would play this in a longer game where I have more time to think. But the other move it likes is taking on b3. Oh, it's the same thing, just a different move order. So I go bishop e4, which is still a good move. Knight bd2. It's not the best move, but I think it's the most natural move, I would personally say. Knight bd7 is a good move. e6 is playable. You can apparently take straight away, but eh. bishop g7. Here I wasn't thrilled after g5. Take. Can you do this? Queen b6 here. f3 trapping the bishop. This is kind of a crazy position. And then the king, like, runs to pick the bishop up. And it's two pieces for a rook. I feel like white has to be better here, no? Knight d7, king f2. The bishop can't escape. I don't know. The computer likes black's position, but I'm not sure. Maybe you can get two pawns out of it, and the king has to waste time going after you. So let's say something like this, and then you take on f3. You get two pawns and a rook for two pieces. Maybe you can strangle the white position a bit. But I feel like over a longer period of time, it's way easier to play with the white pieces with the two pieces. That was a weird sentence. But uh, yeah, knight bd2, knight bd7, I think was a bit more natural. And g5 is what I expected. And it's not the best move. Bishop g2 is better. Um, taking on e4 is also fine. And I was just going to do something like this. Maybe bishop g2. I always have the option of f5 if I want it. Bishop g7. For me, this is quite a comfortable game. Yes, my opponent has the bishop pair. But I have a ton of pawns on light squares. I can trade the queens if I want to. And if my opponent moves the queen, I have good pressure on b2. And my knights seem pretty good. My knights seem pretty good. I can maybe challenge the g-pawn. I can push f5, like I said, to secure the knight if I want. I take this position, personally. As the black pieces, this is basically dead equal, but with dynamic play. So it's not like dead equal as in a draw. It's dead equal as in there's chances for both sides. And as the black pieces, I'm not going to complain. But we don't get that. We get g5. And if I move the knight... Then white is doing very well. After something like this, I think I explained during the game, it becomes very difficult to defend the e4 pawn. I didn't really see... Okay, I can go e3, which is apparently the best move, giving the pawn up to double white's pawns, but I'm, I'm not getting anything from this game. So I take on f3. You can't take here because I'll take your rook, and as opposed to the previous line, there's no bishop on g7 to take. So knight f3, knight e4, uh, if you take with the pawn, uh, then you're just not doing good. Your pawn structure is kind of ruined, my knight might be coming in. This queen has nowhere to go, and the computer actually wants to trade and then put the knight on b3 so that f4 is controlled by the bishop. 
because the knight has nowhere else it can go to really but this position is 100% be better for black and this whole h6 idea comes back into play which i was a massive fan of during the game that we got but knight f3 knight e4 bishop g2 we go h6 which is the best move i was very happy about this you can play moves like e6. I'm sure you can play bishop g7, but I feel like h6 is more accurate, and the computer agrees with me. In some of these positions, it suggests trading queens, but I don't know. If my opponent wants to retreat with a move like queen c2, which is playable, then I think I'm happy, because I can always bring my queen back if I want, but for the meantime, I've got good pressure, and maybe I'll play c5 at some point. It might activate this bishop, so it's up in the air but it's a possibility knight e5 though and this is not good h4 is better which i feel like was a bit of a more obvious move i probably take in this position knight takes and okay we kind of have an equal ish position i can go for this maneuver like i was describing during the game i can trade queens knight ef6 isn't sorry like EF6, the computer doesn't mind. But I like the pressure on the H file personally. Knight E5 though, not great. Taking is good. Although, the computer does mention the knight takes G5 move. Now, I rejected this because I was worried about knight D7. And if king D7, the queen comes back to C2 and my king can't castle. But the computer says that I can just take. The knight can give a desperado check on f6 if it wants before it takes back the queen. But I'm just up a pawn. And I eh, I guess white's pawn structure isn't amazing. But the computer thinks this is very good. I guess you can go f5, bishop g7 maybe. Put the king in the center of the board. Bring the a pawn up, rooks to the e file, something along those lines. And maybe the knight gets into e4 in the future. But yeah, I take on e5 because I was kind of expecting... What was I expecting? Maybe something like this. Oh, that blunders queen f2. Okay, I straight up just missed that. <laughs> so my idea was to go knight c5 to attack the queen, which is a good move. I mean, obviously, queen f2 is completely winning. And to be fair, if we got this position, I probably would have seen it. But this was my idea in my head. And it's still a good position for black. Because if the queen retreats, I have good pressure. And if you take, then I again have good pressure. And the knight's quite nice on c5. This e5 pawn is still weak. The g5 pawn is still weak. And if you want to trade with me like this, I think it can only benefit me. Pressure on the h-file, pressure on the a-file. My knight may be coming into a square like a4, maybe e6, f4. This is nice. But my opponent instead takes on b6, which the computer says is a mistake. a, b6, and he just trades everything. Take, take, take. We're down to rooks and bishops. e6 is a mistake. Whoa. Okay, so I had the right idea. I had the right idea because the issue is if I play a move like bishop g7 e6 and white is kind of hanging on in this scenario because if I take my triple pawns so they're not great but the computer says go king d7 so you stop e6 because the king would take and keep the pawn structure intact and he, the computer just wants to put the king on e6 and pressure e5 that way then bring the bishop out. So let's say something like bishop f4, king e6. This is so cool. Uh, let's just say e3 for sake of argument. I could even just take this and overload the bishop. And my king ends up on e5 completely safe. Mad. That is really, really cool. I didn't spot this idea though. This is why computer analysis, if used correctly, can be great. Because you find wacky ideas like this. And who knows, maybe someday in the future, I or one of you guys watching will use this kind of idea in your own game. Because the king is not vulnerable. The light squares, we control them. And 
with a dark squared bishop on the board, you can't access the light squares and the rooks can't really do a whole lot down these files just because of the way the pawns are set. So e6 is a mistake. f4 is a miss though. Okay, so what's better? a4? No one plays a4. <laughs> I'm sorry, but no one does that. h4? Okay, more reasonable. Bishop e3? Also reasonable. Let's say bishop e3, I take. Bishop takes, so we claim that white wastes a move. Mm, bishop g7, bishop f6, takes, takes, rook h4, swinging to f4, so e3 stopping that. I still think this is winning for black. I do, because the black rooks are way more active than the white rooks. And f6 is probably going to fall at some point. It's difficult to access the e4 pawn. So, okay. f4 is played by my opponent, though. And, yeah, so taking here is better. Now, I didn't do this because my thought process was that I just fix his structure. Rook a5. If this is played, we take and overload the pawn. This is winning. And yeah, if bishop f4, same thing, it's overloaded. Huh. That doesn't work in this case, because he does have bishop f4. And he's a move short. He's basically a move behind if we do this first. And we also get rid of our weakness, I suppose. Maybe I was a bit too hasty with this decision. But I still thought this was a good position. Rook h4 is a nice move. The computer likes it. Other moves to consider are bishop g7, but I wasn't convinced after bishop f4. Rook a5, b4, I didn't see what I do here. So rook d5. How we do this? So I, I saw this line, and I wasn't convinced. Obviously, if this happens, great. I'm up a pawn... And this is going to fall. I'm winning. But I thought he might be able to do this. Bishop a1. And d e6 is what I was worried about. And f... No, not after f6. After I take. My pawn structure is terrible. King d2. Bishop d4. Computer still thinks I'm good. I don't know if I agree though. Let's say e3. Bishop g7. This is tough to push for a win, in my opinion, anyway. Maybe I have e5 to relinquish the bishop's defense of g5? But this is also looking a fair bit ahead in the future. I chose rook h4, though, and the computer still likes it. Bishop e3. Bishop c5 is fine. If he trades with me, then I feel like it's very difficult for him to try and defend this position. Here, e3 check is the best move. And if you take... Rook a5? Going after this? I guess it's just so difficult for white to move. Let's say a3. c4. I open this up. The king can't cross the fourth rank. And you can't defend yourself. It's the white pieces. And g5 is probably going to fall, and b2 might fall, and h3 might fall, and even e2 might fall. It's just positional domination. We dominate the light squares. But okay. Bishop e3, bishop c5, bishop f2 is played. I didn't like taking, because the king gets to g3, and I feel like it fixes a lot of white's problems. Apparently the idea is still e3 check, and if you take, then again this whole rook a5 ordeal. I did not see this. And the king doesn't have to take on e3 either. Rook f4 though. Bishop g3 is a mistake. So if you trade now. I was thinking white might be able to go for rook f1. But I guess I just go back here. The rook probably has to return. e3. c4 might be coming in. And yeah, the white king is not happy. The queenside castles I just take on a2. And the king can't move up. Bishop g3, rook f5. Black is winning, according to the engine. h4 is played, best move. King e3, sorry, king e7 is an inaccuracy. Bishop e3 is better. 
I feel like I considered this move, but I rejected it for some reason. I actually don't know why, because this just cuts the king off, and we're controlling so many squares. I think rook f1 was my problem, and I didn't want to take. And I'm right for saying that, but apparently I just don't. And if he takes me, I take with the e-pawn. Put the king on e6, probably. And I guess e the position is just great. I don't know. Let's say a3. Rook h8. Rook d1. Oh, cool tactic. I can do this. And yeah, that whole idea that I was on about, about back rank mates, it exists. That's really cool. But okay, I choose king e7. Because I wanted to swing this rook to the h file. a3. b5. b5 is not good. Bishop e3 is better. I, I should have played that. And even if I go rook h8, b5 is fine because I have bishop e3. I don't know what I was worried about. I think I was concerned about moves like rook h3 going for the bishop. But I can just take. And yeah, this is an issue. But alright, alright. I'm allowed to make some mistakes. I'm allowed to make some mistakes. King e7, a3, b5, rook d1. Again, bishop e3 is good, but we choose rook to h8 because I'm an idiot. Rook h2. Yeah, this seemed like an odd move. Rook f1 looked far more natural to me. Because again, if I take, it is good for white. And apparently the only really winning idea is bishop to e3. But even here, like something like takes takes, you do have... No, no you don't because h4 will hang. D6, bishop c1, this is a tough line to see, tough line to see, but okay, we both make some mistakes, end games are difficult, rook d6, bishop c7, rook d4, and yeah, we go for this, bishop takes e5 ordeal, because you can't take because of bishop g3, so it takes takes, and we're up a pawn, but it's much worse than that, it's far worse, because white has no moves doesn't. If he goes for a move like e3, I'm just going to take here. Wait, can I not just push this first? And then the rook's defended, so that's the point of e3. And if I take and then take, where's my advantage? I actually don't know. I mean, I'm up a pawn. I guess my pawn structure is better than my opponent's, because he's got these two pawn islands. But it's difficult. It's not easy. Rook e5, king f2 though. So e3 is the best, because it allows this. The issue is, if my opponent plays, I don't know, let's just say a nothing move, like king d1. Then I have c5, we kick the rook out, and then I take here, and he can't take in this scenario because e3 isn't played allowing this rook on d2 to defend the rook on h2 cool little concept but king f2 c5 the rook has to retreat we take on g5 and we're up two pawns king e3 we go f5 best move rook g4 is also playable defending and attacking but f5 i preferred because it just secured the pawn structure forever now e4 is defended forever. King f4, rook g4, and my opponent just steps into a trap. He needs to go back to e3 and just accept that he's going down three pawns. But this is game over. I feel like it's a good practical idea by my opponent to try and infiltrate with king e5, rook d6, taking e6, and trying to go after my king and my pawns. If I didn't have this whole e3 move... so e3 is minus 18, right? And white has to sacrifice a rook so that he doesn't get mated. If I choose something else, let's say rook h5, then it's only minus 2.6. It's still winning, of course, but it's not as winning. Because white needs to go e3 himself. He needs to find this idea to stop me from doing it and preparing rook e4 with mating ideas. Again, tough to see, though. Really tough to see. King e5, we go e3, and it's just game over. The best he can do is sacrifice his rook. He goes rook d6. And to be fair to him, 
to be fair, it is the best idea because he's getting mated regardless. And if I do something like rook h5, then the position's fine. Not fine, I'm still winning, but it's playable for white. Like, he wins the pawn, his king doesn't get mated, the king maybe runs d6, uh, going after the queenside pawns, and white has some chances, but yeah, we just have mate in the middle of the board, and you could call it fortunate that this mating pattern existed, but I think my position was just there, yeah, just so good in this game, that when you get a good position with active pieces, a strong pawn structure, tactics tend to go your way most of the time. And even if you don't plan for it to happen, if you place your pieces better, 95% of the time the tactics will just flow in your direction because you're attacking more things, your pieces are better defended, etc. So, very interesting game. No fireworks or anything. And maybe you can call the ending fireworks because it's a pretty cool mating pattern. But, no, I think it's a very interesting like game showing how to kind of grind an advantage from a kind of tame looking middle game and opening so yeah i feel like that's where you can kind of show your skill in chess a bit more fireworks and tactics of course show skill but i think my um my playstyle is definitely more positional so games like this probably suit me a bit more anyway if you made it to the end of the video thank you very much for watching and i'll see you in the next one where we will be pushing over 2000 again Hopefully we don't mess it up.